I'm Andrew Corbett. In 2014, I invited Dr Hugh Ross from the organisation Reasons to Believe to come to Australia. Two years later, I invited Dr Jeff Zwerink, also of Reasons to Believe. And again, prior to him arriving, he was accused of being a part of an organisation that was not actually Christian, that it was seeking to undermine the Christian faith and seeking to impose science into the Bible. So in addressing these issues, I wanted to raise them directly with Dr. Jeff Zwerink because initially, when I invited Dr. Ross in 2014, I was also linked in with the accusations, being called a heretic, being called someone who is undermining the gospel and actually bringing division to the church as a result. I found these accusations at the time to be very hurtful. In this video, I'm talking with Dr. Jeff Swing. Uh, I've really appreciated your being here with us over these last few days, Jeff. It's been, been wonderful. Just the feedback we've been getting has been great. I've personally enjoyed spending time with you and and I know many others have, have made positive comment as well. So thank you again. For well, thanks, Aaron. I, I've <laughs> tremendously enjoyed my time here, and uh, I'm just glad to be a part of what you're doing and how God's working down here. Great. You have a, a PhD in astrophysics, which means you're really in, kind of concerned about the stuff that's out there in space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say it's using a, or using a telescope to figure out how the world works. So. Okay. So your PhD from Iowa State Correct. University and then you went to, you took up a, a was it a, a research position with UC Riverside? Is That's that correct. So University of California Riverside, so the University of California, similar to the University of Tasmania has different campuses and, and the two, the two most well-known campuses of University of California would be Berkeley and Los Angeles right. and after your position at UC Riverside, you were then offered a position at UCLA, That's uh, Los Angeles, and you're still there as a research scholar. You also were essentially raised in a home where you, you saw your parents become Christians right. and you saw the impact of Christ in their lives and particularly in your dad who was a chemistry professor. Right. But if we sort of cut to the chase here that you see no problem with what science tells us about how the world began, how the world works, and what the Bible says. Is that fair to say? That is exactly fair to say. In, in summary, in just briefly, why is that? I would say that if, if God's the author of creation, that he's the one who created the universe, and he's the one who's the inspiration for scripture, when we study scripture and when we study creation, we gotta get the same thing. And that's what I see. Every place where I've looked, they either agree or in the what we don't know, there's always a way to have them still agree. And so I find that great evidence that God is who he says he is. Okay. Here's, here's the first thing. Are you aware that Dr. Hiros and Dr. Jeff Swearing, from reasons to believe teach that creation was not created in literal seven days as the Bible teaches? How do you respond? I would say if those days, if you demand that those days are seven 24-hour days, then I would agree with that charge. But I would disagree that we're arguing that the Bible doesn't accurately describe how God created. Okay. So, uh, you know, if I were to go investigate all of the hermeneutics, the people who hold scripture in high regard, and they say this is only seven 24-hour days, it's got to be six to 10,000 years, then I would be right in that camp. I mean, what uh, scripture in, says, right. I'm there. Okay, so if, if the weight of science and, or sorry, what you're saying is if the weight of biblical scholarship... Independent of what the science Independent said. of the science. If the bulk of biblical scholars, Hebrew scholars, mm -hmm. said this in Genesis chapter 1 can only mean 24-hour consecutive literal days, you would... You would Take that over the science, is that correct? Yes, and, and you will find if you go back and talk to people when I was in college, I was defending exactly that view because okay. I thought that's what scripture what demanded. What the scripture taught, okay. Right. That word day uh, in the Hebrew is what word? Yom, Yom. Y-O-M. And it can mean what? 
It can mean the daylight portion of a day. So we're in the yom portion of the day. So today we went to church. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it can mean a 24-hour time. Mm -hmm. um, it can mean a long but definite period of time. So if we would say, you know, uh, like... Back in uh, Abraham's day. Back in Abraham's day, yes. So so Abraham those, longed to see my day, John yes. chapter 8. Mm -hmm. and, and what's interesting is that you find the the term day used to refer to a long period of time in Genesis 1. You use day to refer to the daylight portion of, the, uh, of, of time. Uh, you know, God created the light, he called the light day, the darkness he called night. And in Genesis 4, it's referred to as a 24-hour day for days and signs and seasons. So Genesis 1 uses all of those definitions. Mm -hmm. The question is, what does it mean when it talks about the first day, or day one, the second day, the third mm -hmm. day? And before day four, where it seems like the cycle of 24 hour periods are, are definitely there. Or at least until, we, until the, the observer was aware of yeah. what the sun, moon, and stars were. So, okay. So, yeah. And then in Genesis 2 4, Yom is used, that word day is used to speak of the whole six the whole creation week. days right. of creation. It's, it's called a Yom. Right. In the, so we've got the four biblical, literal, Biblical uses of that word day in Genesis 1 and 2. Right. Right there. So to be accused of not taking it literally is, is, is not fair. Mm -hmm. Because we do believe in a literal six-day creation and, and God rested on the seventh day. The issue is which of those four literal interpretations makes the most sense? Right. Okay, biblically. So we're not, we're not using science to interpret the Bible right. in that sense. Okay. The, the next thing was uh, that the Garden of Eden had not ever experienced or seen death. And that physical death in our world is not the result of Adam's sin, but has been in existence for billions of years before Adam was even created. This writer says, These things change the gospel and are completely unbiblical according to Romans 5.12, which is, according to this, that there was no death, any biological death, mm -hmm. in plant, insect, animal or human death before Adam sinned. And this person claims that's a central Bible teaching. Is it? I find that position difficult to hold. Um, Biblically or scientifically? Biblically. Uh, okay. I'm an, ast I'm an astronomer, not a, phys or not a biologist, so yep. I don't really pay attention to a lot of the yeah. what's going on I'm there. I'm not a but, biologist okay, either. So. I'm but not a a, you look through scripture, and, and a few things that really stand out to me is that, one, that passage in Romans, it talks about how because man sinned, death spread to all man. Okay, and now so, that's an important point. Yes. Romans 5.12 says, by one man's sin, death came into the world, death came to all mankind. Right. Not plants, insects, animals. Unless Christ's salvation also applies to plants, insects, and animals, then yes, it's just to okay. humanity. And okay. I, I, what I see there is that my position and the position of RTB is that God created humanity, placed them in the garden, and had they not eaten the tree of life, they would never have died. Or sorry, had they not eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They would never have died. Sure. Just be careful. Sure. So they would not have died. So this is not God created a world where man was going to die, and that's just the run of the mill, the way things work. Right. That had Adam and Eve not sinned, humanity would have never perished. Okay, I, I really hope people got that clear because that is you are accused of teaching exactly the opposite of that. Right. One more thing, and we've gone well, a little the, bit. The longer. other thing I would mm -hmm. say in that is that I find it difficult to read through Scripture and see where scripture says that there was no death or that death is the result of God's plan B that well man fell now I've got to yeah. introduce death okay. God is praised yes. for providing food to the animals pray to the animals yeah P -R -E -Y. Pre -R yeah, P -R -E -Y, yeah. 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 so uh, my, my simple response to this person was if, the, if there was no physical biological death before Adam sinned and it's a central teaching of the Bible, give me one verse that says it. Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard back from them yet. 
final question, and I'm sorry, I've gone longer than I wanted to, but I'm in a rant mood, I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't have to apologize, I, it's, I've like, see the whole week here, so it's, it's not a pattern as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're accused of not, of teaching that there was no literal Adam, that Adam was the result of the evolution of Neanderthals. How say they? I really don't understand how someone could say that about our organization. I can point you to the web page on our website where we say Adam was a created, God intervened to bring about Adam and Eve. And we specifically distinguish that there are other creatures that may look like humanity, but they're not humanity. And God created Adam and Eve. I just don't, I do not see how someone could characterize our position as Adam and Eve are not literal historical figures. In fact, in our discussions with a very prominent organization that is arguing that man is just the latest, greatest evolutionary creation, that is really one of the key dividing points between organizations, is that we hold Adam and Eve are the literal let, progenitors let, of all let's, humanity. Let's be clear. You're not saying God took a Neanderthal and breathed the image of God into that, whatever that was, and made that person Adam. No, God intervened and created Adam and Eve in the same way God intervened and created the universe. Oh, gee, I hope that's clear. <laughs> I want to thank you for allowing me this little rant, and I want to thank you for, for being in the lounge room, sipping your hot chocolate while you listen to it. Well, I've, I've got to say, I really appreciate this, because I, I, people can disagree with me all they want. I really, I mean, I've got my positions. I can say why, and that's true of our organization. But I do think, just from a Christian perspective, one thing that haunts me is that whenever I disagree with someone, I have got to make sure I'm characterizing their position correctly. Yeah, and that's, that was my biggest concern here. This is just unfair, some of this. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jeff Swearing. And so there is nothing that undermines the gospel in this. In fact, it's science that bolsters the creation story. And we see a compatibility between the record of nature, as it says in the Belgic, the Belgic Confession, that God has given us two revelations, general revelation and special revelation. General revelation is how we see God in, in, and his handiwork, and special revelation is uniquely authoritative. That's the word of God. Together, according to the Belgic Confession, these two present one picture of God and his work. And we agree. And that's largely the position of reasons to believe. And it's a position that is not heretical. It doesn't undermine the gospel. It does not endorse Darwinian evolution as the means by which God created. And it, it is in complete concord with many of the ancient uh, commentators and fathers of the faith as well. Recently, there was an international a conference on biblical inerrancy. Some 300 delegates, of the world's leading Bible scholars, went to this conference and they signed a document reinforcing and reiterating the biblical inerrancy. Of the 300 people that attended, these world leading scholars, it's estimated that 98% of them held to what's called an old earth view. That is the view promoted by reasons to believe. Now that number could be wrong. That 98% number could be wrong. According to Greg Kokel, who recently said that number could be wrong because it could have been 99%. But this is telling. The world's leading scholars all have examined the text and consider the old earth view to be the most biblically literal view of Genesis 1 and 2. Added to this, there's a concordance between the 16 other biblical accounts of creation, some 18 in total in scripture, and they all have to concord to show that God created a world in which a death uh, is the means by which life comes. Death is woven into the fabric of creation, and out of it, out of this, comes the redemption story that God would ultimately use death to bring the ultimate life. The death of Christ brings eternal life to all who turn to him and put their faith and trust in him. This is woven into the fabric of creation. This is why 
accusations of being heretical, of uh, being uh, people who are uh, undermining the gospel and being people who are charlatans rather than genuine Christians is hurtful and it's, it's actually wrong. <laughs> Thank you for letting me explain our position. I'm Andrew Corbett. For more information, I encourage you to visit reasons.org.